Well, now we quickly move on to our next, uh, another interesting uh, panel discussion on transcending borders with the right templates and business models, Indian FinTech Odyssey in global markets. And let's welcome our co-panelists here on stage, Mr. Arif Khan, CIO Razor Pay, Mr. Sanjay Swami, Managing Partner and Co-Founder, Prime Venture Partners, and Ms. Lizzie Chapman, FinTech Builder. Well, let's welcome our moderator for this session, Ms. Monica Jasuja, Head of Product, FinTech and Payments, Board Member, Independent Director, and Startup Advisor. Welcome everyone, and let's begin with the session. Just testing if everything is working. I think it is. So thank you everyone who's joined us today. We're going to have a really exciting discussion and I have with me friends as well as builders from the fintech and payments ecosystem in India. What I'm most excited about today is to actually talk about a subject that all of us are interested in asking the panelists, which is how do we take innovation from India and actually transcend borders and take it to the globe? So. I think we will have a little bit of time for questions, so please keep those coming. In the meantime, I'm also going to offload some of my moderation duties to Sanjay. So we are going to make the VC do the work here. However, I will first introduce him. So I have the pleasure of introducing Sanjay, who happens to be my oldest friend in fintech and payments. But that's not by age. Huh? <laughs> so yes, we are not really old, but Although we are… Although it might be true. <laughs> So he, in 2006, I spoke to him for the first time about payments and I had recently joined at that point in time a company and he was building what happened to be India's first solution, a product solution with a telco in the payments business. So that is what Sanjay is and since that time we have a lot of controversial discussions mostly non-publicly but this time around we are going to have a public discussion and we are going to make it controversial. So welcome Sanjay. Thanks, Monica. Um, yeah, really looking forward to fighting with you some more in public <laughs> here. Uh, we have tried on Twitter spaces in the yes. past as well. Uh, maybe I'll start by introducing you, right? So, um, how many of you know Monica here? Oh. All right. God bless you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told you. So, so uh, anyway, I hope the audience comes in soon because this is the most interesting part of our panel. Um, so, Monica, you know, is... Um, I think she was working at a company called ACL Wireless when I first spoke to her. I don't know if the company is still around. I, remember. I looked up LinkedIn. <laughs> but no, I remember those. And you know, that was in the messaging space, I think something closer to Gupshop these days. Yes. And then subsequently worked at PayPal. I, I, I don't know if there's a company she's not worked at. PayPal, several years. Uh, MasterCard. MasterCard, several years. Um, and has worked at, uh, in Indonesia with GoTo. Um, certainly a few other stints that are missing out. But there's literally nothing in fintech and payments in particular that she hasn't seen, hasn't done, and knows everything about. So she's the, uh, the star of uh, the payments industry and, you know, I think has also turned into a very strong spokesperson for the industry and the ecosystem. Um, and how many million followers you have on Twitter now? Very few. <laughs> Fewer than you, Sanjay. No, 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 no. She's got the, uh, yeah, exactly. She has the Prime Minister following her on Twitter. So if you guys are standing outside, you're missing out on something here. Um, but great to, to be on this panel. Uh, alongside me on the right is Arif. Uh, he's the reason I'm still sitting here, uh, rather than being on a, retired on an island in Hawaii. No, just kidding. Arif and I go back a long ways, you know, as, uh, as you may have guessed, I'm... I'm not the youngest person around, but um, we, uh, I'm putting you in the same bracket <laughs> inadvertently. Now, Arif is probably the most friendly product guy you could ever hope to talk to at a bank, right? And I had the privilege of working with him during my MCheck days uh, when he was at HDFC Bank, where he spent a good, what, 15 years? And again, the boss of anything to do with cards and payments on the issuing side, on the acquiring side, Later, uh, did one stint at Razor Pay, went back to the dark side to fix things at NPCI and was their uh, chief innovation officer at NPCI for the longest time. And is now back at Razor Pay as a chief innovation officer. And 
just an amazing guy to talk to and you know if you don't get some time to ask him questions here please make sure you catch up with him uh, offline um, and you know none of us uh, we all have official responsibilities in the work we do but i think we're here more as an ecosystem uh, 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 you know uh, with the mindset of you know helping the ecosystem here in the startup ecosystem uh, lizzie um, gosh i was trying to recall when we first met and you were at the welcome group there, which is a, a large limited partner in VC funds in the UK. And then uh, that was the first time we met, I remember, at the Oberoi in Bangalore. Um, and then subsequently, next thing I knew, she had moved to Bombay. And she was, uh, you know, uh, working here, you know, trying to set up and, you know, with uh, Wonga, which was one of the really early innovators in financial services in the UK. Uh, and then one day she called me and said, I got something to show you. And she showed up in my office with a Figma type demo of what was to be India's first digital bank, right? And this was probably almost six months before you actually launched, yeah. right? And it was just the concept on her phone and I'd spent some time with Aadhaar and working on EKYC and stuff. And they were the first to really adopt EKYC and did some really crazy innovative things. You could walk into a coffee day and you know open a bank account, which was unheard of at the time, and frankly, is not being done even today, yeah. right? So um, you know, she's really pioneered a, a lot of that, and subsequently, uh, you know, decided to become an entrepreneur again. Um, started Zest Money, you know, and I think her passion for solving the BNPL problem at scale, I think, you know, we've all uh, read a lot about. Uh, and lastly, uh, and now is again back to being an entrepreneur. I don't know if you're still in stealth, but uh, certainly working in, in this, in, I'm assuming in this space. Uh, they shouldn't have been on this panel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's great to have all of you here. And I have to say a huge shout out to Samir and the Digital Fifth team. This is an extraordinary event. I'm blown away. I had no idea it was such a big event. And uh, great to be here with everyone. Thank you, Sanjay. You made my job so much easier because now I can ask all the tough questions starting with you. <laughs> so putting on the VC hat, not a product hat, at this point for everybody who's trying to understand what is happening with fintech and what are we going to do to take our innovations to the global stage, the question to you is, based on your investment experience, what are the most promising global markets that India should be looking at? And what are some of the Indian fintech solutions that the world wants? not just from India, but in terms of product solutions for problem solving. Um, just how many people here are entrepreneurs? Okay, and any early, I mean, how many are post product market fit in your minds? Okay, so fairly early companies, right? So um, look, I think there is this massive global opportunity in this country called Bharat that I really think everybody has got tremendous opportunity for. Um, but I think first thing I like to ask companies is, are you a fintech or are you a financial services play? Um, and what, what do you think you will be when you grow up, right? So, and the nuance here is, you know, you have companies which are doing consumer lending plays, consumer, uh, which might be NBFCs, might or might not be NBFCs today, etc. But if you are a customer facing product, then I call you, I label you as a financial services player versus if you are a technology partner or a quote-unquote vendor to a financial services provider, whether it's a startup, fintech, uh, I mean financial services player, or a bank, or an NBFC, or what have you, right? Um, so from my perspective, I think it's important to understand that. Broadly, if you're going to be offering financial services, then it's likely that you're going to be primarily focused in India, and you better have a large enough opportunity in India. But if you're going to be a technology player, then India might be the first market, might not even be a market, right? And we talk about this as something new, but Indian companies have been selling technology solutions around the world for years, several years, right? Uh, some of the, uh, I guess one could argue that something from an Infosys Finical onwards, right? But today I think, you know, with cloud-based infrastructure that's uh, being accepted worldwide, um, one of the big things that has happened in the last 10, 15 years is, you know, thanks to Aadhaar all the way through UPI, including, you know, whether it's ESA and EKYC and all of these, I think Indian infrastructure is being respected amazingly, right? So we are going to see more and more adoption of India-based solutions uh, in the rest of the world. So as a VC, for us, it's very simple. We want to see people who are super passionate about solving a problem, who have deep insights about solving that problem, 
and who are going to stick through good and bad days, of which there will be a lot more bad days than good days, especially in the leap year, you get one extra bad day uh, as an entrepreneur. And, but you're passionate about solving the problem. Path to building a large company is, in theory, very simple. Yes. We never think about, can this be the next unicorn or the next decacorn? It's a question of, can you get to a million dollars of revenue? Can you get to $10 million of revenue? And is there a path to getting to $100 million? $10 of million dollars of revenue? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I think I heard the numbers right. <laughs> yes. But Sanjay, so 110, 2500 is sort of how we oh, think about it. Thank you so much. And uh, it's very important for companies to, to be able to scale there, yet being sort of well grounded and you know, the first dollar is always the hardest and the first million is always the hardest anyway. So is it fair to say that when you are evaluating companies, you're looking at the product, you're looking at the technology and you're looking at the founders being passionate enough to solve that problem? I think we're looking at the founders and their nuanced understanding of the problem and their passion to solve the problem. I think the product and the solutions will evolve and change. Certainly, there needs to be a starting point, but that is the easy part to solve. Mm. I think what we look for is, have they figured out the market and will the customer buy if they solve the problem? Absolutely. Just one small thing uh, to, before I go to Arif. Do you feel that the product solutions that India has created have product market fit elsewhere? I think... Almost all banking-related or financial services-related problems exist in all parts of the world hmm. for the most part, right? So certainly some of the nuances around, you know, am I using India stack, you know, yeah, even that might be different, but the components will be the same, right? You need to do identity, you need to do authentication, you need to do signatures, you need to do all of that stuff. So the nuances will be different, but I think well-architected products in fintechs, you know, will work well globally. Super, this is a great segue, and I didn't put, it, put, uh, put Sanjay up to this, but Arif, who has built many great products, including at HDFC, want to ask you, now with your understanding and experience of global markets, specifically in Razorpay right now, which markets are, repre are representative of this amazing opportunity? That's number one, and what are the challenges that you would be facing when you're thinking about global sure. expansion? So, uh, you know, before I uh, try and answer that, right, uh, just taking a leaf out of what Sanjay mentioned of India stack, digital public, right? I think uh, most, I think the technology components are there. I think the protocol layer, as we call it, is there. In my experience, right, both as NPCI and now, I think this understanding that we have that, you know, we've done something great in the country, it's going to work somewhere else. Technically, yes, but that's not the way it plays out, right? Uh, I think very often we look at some of the components and we don't look at the larger picture. For example, I keep telling people, it's a very unpopular view, that India did very well in digital stacks, especially in payments, because we had a Payment and Settlement Act. Right? Now, how many countries really have something equal to a Payment and Settlement Act that empowers organization not for profit like NPCI to exist over there and do whatever they do at the clearinghouse, right? So this concept, right, I'm, I'm really looking forward that NIPL and PCI uh, really take some of the stack over there and it creates an advantage, but I think it's not going to be as easy as we generally assume. Coming back to us at Razorpay, well, I wouldn't call ourselves a global company yet. Uh, what we have, today we operate through Curlec in Malaysia, that's a company that we acquired uh, around a year, year and a half back. You know, you pick up any article, management article or a consulting article, they'll tell you there are nuances of, you know, the culture, the language, et cetera, and all those kind of things. So I think that's common know-how. But an interesting thing uh, which we took a call internally, and that was really helpful, and it actually goes back to the example uh, Sanjay mentioned of, uh, Sanjay was running a company called MCheck, right? Yes. And I was at the JC Bank we were trying to do together, right? One of the reasons, uh, if I, in a certain way, in my mind, MCheck was a success, yes. but it was not a commercial success, right? Uh, but from a concept, it was pre-wallet, Yes. It was pre-UPI, it was pre-IMPS. Those days, people used to not talk about virtual account and ledgers, and we were talking about it, right? Yes. So it was pre-PTM, I mean, I don't know, 2003? Uh, 2006. 2006, right? One of the reasons I believed, uh, without blaming anyone, we were not able to do what we were, because there were these guys, I wouldn't say young, uh, who had these great ideas, super energy, a lot of enthusiasm, and me sitting on the banking side was trying to fit them into the banking ecosystem, yes. right? Trying to apply our SOPs, our process, our way of thinking, our interpretation to them, right? Correct. Now, if you, now you take this learning and experience and when we went to Malaysia, we had this opportunity to acquire a, it was a reasonably small entity called Curlec. 
And then we figured out that, look, it's not we trying to operate Curlake out of India. Hmm. Of course, we could do some heavy lifting in terms of tech stack and, you know, some of these are, you know, like a template you can take it over there. But the idea was let the founders, and they were great founders we have over there, Steve and Zach, right? Let them operate as a startup. Give them that space, give them the freedom because they understand the nuances of that geography far better, right? Hmm. I think that's something that really we need to look out and watch out for. Very rarely will you see, at least I have not come across many instances where Indian fintechs, right, have successfully globalized or even gone to four or five countries and really been able to make some business out of it, right? Exactly. By business, I don't necessarily mean the valuation. What I mean is really an impact. Correct. So that continues to be the case. There will be very few. Uh, you know, we can talk about Finical, the example that you're talking about, but besides that, I don't recollect many, right? And I think one of the folly is that you try to operate it from your home country. Exactly. And I don't think that works out. It takes away the zero to one. It takes away the, you know, the entire kira, as we say, of the startup. Yes. That, you know, that persistence, it just takes it out, right? Because you become a larger entity, you try to run it. Of course, you're supposed to anchor them, help them. But the local guys running it like a startup, I think is very important, right? So that, I think that's been our biggest learning and probably that's the place we've really done well, right? What we realize is some of the things, right, like stack, right? I mean, like, again, uh, Malaysia, from our understanding, is not necessarily very card heavy. Yeah. Our assumption at some point of time was there. They have some local payments, right? So it's not that you can just replicate the stack. Right? Just to give you an example, Visa Master, which are global companies, right? Yeah. Even Visa Master, the networks over there have their nuances. Okay. There are nuances as to how do you settle. There are nuances as to how do you do your clearing, how the interbank works, right? Not every country has a, as efficient 24 by 7 RTG as NEFT like India. Okay. So all this has an impact. So I think coming back, I think it's a very simple thing. You need to understand that you need someone locally over there and that person should be run. It cannot be that someone from here is flying out every two weeks spending. You need someone planted over there. Right? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Zoho or Freshness, right? they're yeah. good examples who have done well in certain North American and European countries. Yeah. Whatever their model, right, of efficiency, optimization, lower cost, etc. I would like to believe that the top two, three people, I mean, if they had a team of four, a couple of them are planted over there. So I think that's yeah. how it works. Do you want to chime in, Sanjay and Lizzie, on this yeah. one before? Say something controversial. <gasps> Might as well. Why Always not? Right? So I, I, I think there are three different mindsets in India, right? There's a Delhi, Delhi mindset of, I've got to build a business, right? There's the Mumbai mi mindset of, I'm a vendor to the regulated entity. As the Bangalore mindset of I need to be seen as a partner, right? And I think what we are seeing now, and obviously it's a very crass generalization, there are uh, examples of all in all cities, so I will backtrack on being controversial. But I think the, the Bangalore mindset of being a partner is the new opportunity that's emerging, right? Where, you know, Razorpay is not going to another country and saying, you know, I will it'll be powered by Razorpay. It's like I'm launching Razorpay, right? That I'm, I'm probably using you as an example. And that is the mindset that is really exciting in terms of an opportunity, right? Where we are going to be partners and bringing the experience, the expertise, the know-how, and the operational excellence from India, right? And in the past, that only came from a Stripe or a PayPal or a what have you from the US. Now, Indian companies are going to be challenging them. Interesting. I must admit that this is a very controversial thing to say, but localizing from a country is different from localizing sitting in the US or other places headquartered or having mothership offices in Singapore, and I've had the experience of that. So I actually want to bring Lizzie into the conversation and actually ask you this question. You've been a serial builder. You've actually seen and you have been at the receiving end of receiving advice of being able to take fintechs outside. What has been your experience when you're evaluating other markets for expansion, and what are some of the key elements in those products that you think can be taken to a different market and still be as successful? Yeah, no, it's a great point. So I have kind of two different journeys on this uh, topic. One was I actually came to India originally as the, you know, head of international for a UK startup. And that's very common. UK is a tiny market, like a lot of markets uh, in Europe. And so by necessity, within year two or three, there has to be an international plan, right? An international strategy. And what they do, and I was a good example, they take a wannabe entrepreneur and they dump them in the country and say, here's a budget, figure it out. Right? And that's very common. And it generally works you know, in, in many markets. 
Um, India has its own challenges. I would say it took a little bit longer and it was a little bit harder, but look, the, uh, the byproduct is I, I stayed behind. Even that company folded and I'm still here, so that's a, a good sign. Uh, but in India, we don't typically do it that way, right? Because we are sitting on top of what the world sees as one of the biggest and most attractive markets in the world for fintech. And that means we all got waylaid over the last decade in building just for the home market. Everybody had an international story, but nobody actually bothered to really focus on it because there was no reward for that. And sorry, Sanjay, I have to say that. The VCs did not reward Indian startups who said, I'm going to send a team of people to Malaysia. That was considered unnecessary, right? The market I thought you told me I'm not a VC. <laughs> Sorry, he's not a VC. He's an entrepreneur. That's why we talk to him. Uh, he wouldn't be here if he's a VC. No, so what I mean is the last 10 years was a story of, you know, growth, 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 growth in this market. And actually, a very good point Sandra made, which is, are you a fin or are you a tech? We've only started to ask those existential questions in the last few years, I think. If you are a tech, if you're very clear that that's what you're good at, and that's what I learned I like most, I don't love dealing with regulators and, and being the fin as much as I love building products, right? Like a lot of us. Then where can you bring that to the rest of the world? And India, I believe, is on the cusp of an export explosion in fintech. I think the next 10 years will actually be about building businesses bigger than any of us can imagine, bigger than Zoho, bigger than Freshworks, and more premium. I'm sorry to say, but the, even the Finical, the Zoho, these examples are all about an arbitrage that you can build cheaper in India for the world. Forget about that. The rest of the world actually now looks at India in fintech as a premium destination for premium technology. And that's what I'm doing in my, in my new startup. We're going to be exporting some of the best in class product tech from this country to the rest of the world. And I think the secret that a lot of people don't know is banks in the rest of the world, particularly the Western world, are diabolical. They're in dire straits. Nobody that's any way good at tech or product wants to go near a bank in the West, right? Which is a ginormous opportunity for people like us to solve problems for Western world banks. Who will pay for it? And there's going to be billions of dollars spent in the next few years on this upgrade cycle. And I think all of us should be looking at those markets and prioritizing them. That's not to say it's easy. And I think the, the key things we do wrong is number one, we don't take this seriously enough, right? Because we are still very focused on the home market. We spend far too much time at conferences like this, talking to each other, not going outside the door, right? And spending a lot of time in these markets and not being intimidated by them. Uh, you'll be so shocked to see how boring, how under-evolved, particularly the US banking system is. Like, if any one of us went to a conference like this in the US this week, we would just be flabbergasted. So spend more time there, take it more seriously. Um, the other thing I think that we all do is we undersell ourselves in this country. I think take sales really seriously especially in the rest of the world, we already have the branding and the pedigree as being brilliant at building great product from this market. Now let's invest in our sales machines, right? Ultimately, it is a sales business. The best product won't sell itself. And I think we have to become prouder in this country of being, you know, SaaS sales experts. And that's something I'm doing in my company right now, really trying to ingrain a philosophy of being world-class sales machines. Um, and then, you know, really, let's go out there. I think this is, this is our decade. This is our era. It's about those kind of coming together as well as an ecosystem and promoting India on the global stage. I think MPCI have done it really well, but we as companies haven't. And I think it's time to start selling ourselves a lot better. Sanjay, I actually have a sub-question exactly based on what Lizzie said. VCs have always told us that the biggest opportunity is India. You just mentioned Bharat. Then there was an India versus Bharat. Then there was a make in India. Then there was a make for India. Then there was a make in India, make for the world. Which stage are we in and when do we actually 
create this opportunity that Lizzie is talking about, where we actually have global domination and some million dollar companies or billion dollar companies from India? So several questions in one there. Um, but I, I actually was going to uh, get back to what Lizzie was saying with a, you know, with a fairly emotional um, example of Happy, which was a company that we you know, invested in very, very early, almost incubated in our office. Probably had built by far the best card management system, the best 3D secure platform from a computer science perspective, a purist, right? Uh, and Arif knows about this uh, company as well. We've discussed many times. We contemplated launching in the US for an expense management solution three years before Brex, right? And eight years later, you know, we got a solid outcome from Happy. Everybody's happy with it, with $180 million exit to, to, to cred. But Brex is sitting at $14 billion. And when the founder of Brex came and visited us, I was in the meeting with Happy. He couldn't believe the stack we had built. Right? He was like, they literally, you know, built a beautiful front end experience layered on top of, top of MasterCard's uh, card management system, mix platform, everything, right? But got to market in the biggest market opportunity, right? So this is an example of where, you know, yes, you'll get good outcomes in India, but there are spectacular opportunities awaiting us. And it, in hindsight, you know, don't ask, don't get is sort of the situation here, right? So you've got to have the guts, no guts, no glory, right? Having said that, I think today it's a different story because I think India itself is a large opportunity as well. And that is a challenge that founders are going to face. Exactly. Um, and there is always, you know, none of this is a cookie cutter formula. If it was that easy, there would be no VCs. There would be bank loans that everybody would take and build a big business. So you've got to be the best judge of it, you know. And I think we have an opportunity in India to build something that is viable, profitable, will get to good scale. but don't get too caught up in your uh, early success, right? I think it's very hard to say I'm only going to build for international markets. So you need some credibility here. But once you've gotten some good success going here, make sure you carve a side. I have a company in healthcare right now that's doing pilots in the US, right? And when we did the last round, the founder and I spoke and we took an extra half a million dollars and said, we'll only use this money to build, do some pilots in the US. And if it fails, that's fine. We'll, we'll lose a half million dollars but it could be a 100x or a 1,000x bigger opportunity and we need to find out. And I think that's what you owe yourself. If you think there's an opportunity internationally, start thinking about it, carve out some money for it, and, and put a dedicated team and do it the justice it deserves. Yeah. Arif, I want you to chime in on this because you are going slowly. At the same time, you've seen the NPCI way where suddenly we had this big international opportunity. We've spoken about the India stack also, which you mentioned, where it seems like this is a very plug and play solution that you can just stick at. And suddenly it'll stick, you'll just throw it at some wall and suddenly all the countries will be enabled. Obviously you know that it's not going to happen and you've spoken about it. I'd love to understand when do we think that that's the right time where we say, okay, as product builders, we're going to take the money now and we'll venture into another country. Because there is opportunity, but when do you think that is happens? So, Monica, unfortunately, I'm no, for, no profit. So, I think I can talk with a bit of hindsight only, and uh, I really don't have the answer to it, right? But there are a couple of views that I have that I'll share with you, right? I mean, you look at, uh, and I'll stick more to payments and fintech, you know, and not get into some of the other, you know. Uh, Sanjay has far more uh, diverse experience than I ever could. I mean, you look at uh, some of these companies that Sanjay mentioned, right? And Lizzie also mentioned that. So Visa Master are large global networks. They work like uh, railroads. They go into a particular country, and then in and around them, there are companies which provide switch, card management, etc. Right? One of the reasons, besides the go-to-market, etc., the opportunity came to them because Visa Master were dominant over there. There was some standardization. They could replicate in multiple markets, right? And obviously, the biggest market obviously was U.S. If they could do in U.S., they had the margins to invest somewhere else, and so on and so forth. But today, when you look from our point of view, right? Our d digital stack, and I've contributed to it in a small way, it's brilliant, right? But that in itself is not necessarily going to fly everywhere, right? Because I think today with all the geopolitics, uh, there is a possibility that a smaller country will look at it as a means to weaponize, right? And I think we'll have to crack that, right? With, which means there's a lot of diplomacy, there's a lot of our... Uh, uh, government agencies playing a role to enable it, right? And I think if that happens, it paves the way for the India stack getting shipped out. And there, 
because we have done it at scale, there is a referenceability. You can do some of this uh, stuff over there, right? If that doesn't happen, then my worry is a lot of it would become, we'll become like a vendor relationship, right? Correct. And a vendor relationship in current context may not really be there on the value side, right? Correct. A typical example people give of, you know, uh, you look at networks, like where internet came in. I mean, wherever you see a network hardware component, you'll always find these two, three companies, which are like Cisco. Right? And Cisco is right there in the value chain and you can keep building around it. Right? Exactly. We need to make sure that we are there at the core of the value chain. Right? If you're not there at the core of the value chain, I don't, we have a challenge on our hand. Right? So uh, coming back, I think a lot, in my view, besides what we do on our own, real success would be if things like UPI and Rupee really take off or some of the components of India stack, like Mosib, what Mosib is doing, which is not easy. But if that happens, our referenceability is great. We have the experience, right? So I, I think that will really help us accelerate. So I'm getting a cue to close. So I'm going to leave with the last question to all panelists, starting with Lizzie. Lizzie, apart from storytelling, how do we actually create great products, create this India brand that people look to, not just for cheap engineers, which you mentioned, or this amazing, amazing amount of technology, which is all you know, for public good, but go beyond that into build, building those billion dollar businesses. What do we need to do? Lots of things, um, but I'm gonna say one kind of controversial lasting statement, which goes against everything uh, Arif and Sanjay would believe in. Um, everybody's petrified of us building services companies or being vendors, right? It's considered such a, you know, no-no in, in the world of VC and startup. But actually, I just leave one thought in everyone's mind. Um, as I said, most banks in the rest of the world are completely unable to hire tech talent whatsoever. No young people in the world want to work for banks anymore. Sorry, that's a reality. And yet at the same time, every bank wants to launch a gen AI driven CRM and all the most amazing experiences that we all touch every day. There is an opportunity in the world today for very, very high touch tech services businesses. And I would strongly encourage founders in this country to think about pursuing that. If you can build really, really intelligent, beautiful products for large global banks from India, the return on that business is going to be phenomenal, trust me. That is absolutely amazing. So all the builders in the room, if you're looking for ideas, that is a really billion dollar idea. Sanjay, can you top this? Uh, no, I can't, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll nonetheless add a few footnotes. Um, I think all we have to do is, uh, you know, I, I think software architecture from the beginning has got to be thinking global. Even if you're a financial services player, the tech stack has got to be, and I'll give you an example of you know, this company, health tech company, Dozy, launching in the US. They're doing their pilots right now. OTP in the US is, is Pasky, exactly. right? So the founder and I were talking today, right? So hard coding things here is what hurts us a lot. And then, you know, and, and this is true even with compliance in India, which we haven't talked about, right, uh, on this panel. So I, I think a lot of stuff requires really high quality architecture. And that has to be the foundation of everything we do. And if you don't, if you cut corners, if you think you're going to outsource everything to a vendor, then, you know, India will be the only market that you can do it. And, and you might still be very successful. But if you have any aspirations later on of also, you know, starting with a, a financial service, but then launching banking as a service for other parts of the world, then get solid software architecture into your designs and, you know, make it highly configurable. I think Sanjay is trying to say, make everything context-free, unbundled, so <laughs> that's Ooh, great. I like that. Uh, so, Monica, I don't have a comment I have asked from you, since you're connected to the Prime Minister and you, know, you exchange <laughs> tweets with him. I think one of the things that the fintechs will need, right, and going back to the base layer, a lot of countries that you want to operate, they will have local data center regulations, and rightfully so, right? I think there's a need at a diplomacy level to lobby, and I heard that it's happened in Asia and some countries. They've come together and agreed that a particular country data center yes. is... A, it will treat it as a local data center. True. So I think if something like this can happen with India being at the center of it, being very wishful, I think it will also enable and solve a lot of things, right? Just imagine that if, if any of the countries in Southeast Asia, they recognize that India is a legitimate data center for them, I think it works wonders for us. So I hope you could do some, run some of your charm with, uh, of you know. Of course, home. I'm definitely going to take it up to the Prime Minister in the we, next event. She just has to tweet the Prime Minister follows her.
Thank you so much and for having that faith in me. But if you heard that carefully, we actually had a problem statement and a solution given out by Lizzie. We actually have architectural support that Sanjay as a VC and as a builder has provided in terms of how you take your product outside. And then RF being the builder that he is over years of experience with banking and now with innovation at a fintech where he talks about the need for solving a crux of the problem, which is actually data. We didn't have time to go through the rest of the panel and the questions remain unanswered, but we're happy to catch up later. Thank you again, a power-packed speakers and an amazing panel. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for this interesting session. Thank you.